Today on FT Monthly, I take a look at a movement called the Red Pill Movement. It's a movement we've discussed before on this show, but it's made a foray into Christian circles, and I want to discuss a fundamental flaw that I see within the movement that uh, some people are talking about, but not so much some others. Also, is saying Christ is king anti-Semitic? We'll cover what is going on in the Twitterverse with that. And it's Holy Week, which means it's Good Friday. We'll examine some of Jesus's final words on the cross, what they do and they don't mean, and Donald Trump comes out with the Bible. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? That and much, much more on this month's FT Monthly. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is good to be back with another FT Monthly. This is a monthly podcast hosted by yours truly, Josh Klein of Free Thinking Ministries, concerning the hottest topics of the month and from culture or to scripture, whatever floats our boat. Today marks the 10th episode. Almost been doing this for a year. Uh, but this is the first of 2024 where we're not going to feature a long form interview as the episode. So you just get me this week. Uh, and hopefully you hopefully you enjoy it. I don't know. You know what? I don't care. Just just give us some love. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and share this content with someone that maybe it'll trigger them or maybe it'll help out. Either one, hopefully someone that it'll help out. It's been a heck of a start to the year for us at Free Thinking Ministries and in the Klein household. We got a puppy recently, and that's exciting. Uh, well, the Klein household, not Free Thinking Ministries. Uh, and as our family adjusts, uh, we're, we just need prayer. You know, we prepare for all of that. Uh, but Enough, that's enough about me. Let's uh, let's get into it. Let's get to our time. All right, our top three uh, today. Tim and I wrote something called, uh, I think it was voting for an, a moral obligation to vote for an immoral candidate. Uh, we wrote that about uh, voting for Donald Trump, and we'll post the article in the in the description below. Um, so if you don't know about it, I think it's an important read, so I will post it there. Uh, so Tim and I actually have a video coming out about the article in some detail, so I'm not going to get into a lot of it here. Uh, but there's some things that rub me wrong on both sides of this issue, and it's this idea that <clears throat> as Christians, we need to be either all against someone like this or all for them. Well, there, there's no in-between, and I've received pushback on both ends of the spectrum. I, I, I can't get on board with Trump as a person. Um, or at least as his personal, his public persona is concerned. I don't know him personally, um, and I can't get it, I can't get on board with him as a leader for the church to fawn over. I just don't think that is right. I don't think it's good, um, and I do think that evangelical circles have done some damage to our witness with a dogmatic support for the man. The way he just marched right through the primaries is concerning to me. Uh, so I do think we need to speak out against that. But I also think we don't need to. Uh, we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think we can chew the meat, spit out the bones with things like Donald Trump. But uh, I think also he makes it really hard for me personally sometimes. And I want to get into the reason. Uh, I think as Christians, we need to call balls, balls, and strikes, strikes, to use an umpire analogy. And frankly, um, sometimes... Sometimes it's hard to do because you want your side to win politically and things of that nature. Uh, but I think we need to be honest. Just because you vote for a person does not mean it does not mean that you are that you are endorsing everything they say or everything they do or even all of their policies. Uh, I think all it means is that there's a tally mark in his direction for why I think he's a better option than the other option. That's it. That's it. It's not an endorsement of the man. It's not even an endorsement of the candidate in a lot of ways, especially in a general election. Um, but uh, sometimes it can be seen as that. And one of the problems I have with Trumpism is that it borders on blasphemy way too often. And I don't like that at all. Jesus is our savior, not Trump. Uh, Trump may be better than the other option. He may be better than Biden, but he's not better than Jesus. Uh, he's not even close, and I don't think he's a Christian. Um, I know some people might disagree with that, but I just don't. I, I don't see the fruit in his life, and I don't see that because he tends to make things all about him. So we got to call good good and evil evil. And Trump came out recently with a video, and we're going to watch it about a new Bible that he's promoting during Holy Week, um, the 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 week that 
celebrates and honors the death and the resurrection of my Savior, Jesus Christ, Trump used that as a fundraising opportunity to sell a Bible. Um, well, let's just let him let's just let him tell us about it uh, instead of letting me tell us about it. Let's just let's just let uh, him tell us about it. So Trump, as I share my screen here, Trump comes out with this, and I'm going to play it a little bit, and then I'm going to stop it. Um, because I do think we need to be honest about what's going on here. Um, we need to be honest about what, uh, how we ought to react to things like this. And sometimes we just need to call a spade a spade uh, and what have you. So let's take a look. Who doesn't love his song, God Bless the USA, in connection with promoting the God Bless the USA Bible? This Bible is the King James Version and also includes our founding father documents. Yes, the Constitution which I'm fighting for every single day, very hard to keep Americans protected. Also the... Okay, so right off the bat, um, right off the bat, he talks about the Constitution being involved, being, being in the binding of this Bible. He's, he's pushing that. And so he first starts talking about the Bible and God Bless the USA, the, the song, and then he goes right into, right into... Um, right into saying uh talking about the constitution uh well let, let's you know what let's uh let's watch more of it um i don't think we'll watch the whole thing but the bill of rights the declaration of independence and the pledge of allegiance are all part of this god bless the usa bible and it's just very important and very important to me i want to have a lot of people have it you have to have it for your heart for your soul Many of you have never read them and don't know the liberties and rights you have as Americans and how you are being threatened to lose those rights. It's happening all the time. It's a very sad thing that's going on in our country, but we're going to get it turned around. Religion and Christianity are the biggest things missing from this country, and I truly believe that we need to bring them back, and we have to bring them back fast. I think it's one of the biggest problems we have. That's why our country is going haywire. We've lost religion in our country. All Americans need a Bible in their home, and I have many. It's my favorite book. It's a lot of people's favorite book. This Bible is a reminder that the biggest thing we have to bring back America and to make America great again is our religion. Religion is so important. It's so missing, but it's going to come back, and it's going to come back strong, just like our country is going to come back strong. In the end, we do not answer to bureaucrats in Washington. We answer to God in heaven. Christians are under siege. Excuse me. We must protect content that is pro God. We love God and we have to protect anything. Okay, okay. So um so he goes on for a while. <laughs> maybe we'll maybe we'll watch the rest of it. I don't know. Uh but I, there's a few things. You know what? No, uh we, we won't watch we won't watch the rest, uh we won't watch the rest of it. Um so you can go look at that. It's it's all over the Twitter So I got a few things to say. Um Donald Trump says a few true things here. Uh, you're right. We aren't going to answer to uh, bureaucrats. Um, we're going to answer to God someday. This is why releasing a Bible like this is actually a bad idea. Because, uh, yeah, it might score him some political points uh, with um, the right side of his base and 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 people going, yes, we got a, a presidential candidate that cares about Christianity and cares about our values. And finally, finally, instead of somebody that's denigrating us, and I get that. I get that that's what he's going for. But here's here's what I want us to focus on. Let, let's let's move the partisanry aside for a second. So I, I had a small Twitter thread on this, and I just want to go, kind of go through it. Um, no, I don't think you should use the Bible as a prop to generate support for your political allies. I don't think you should use it as a fundraiser for your campaign, especially during Holy Week. I don't think you should add the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible. I think that is despicable. Now, I, I don't think that he's saying he thinks that those things are God-breathed, but it's interesting because in a three-minute ad about his uh, Bible that he's endorsing, he talks about half as much about the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, how it's important that we read them, as he does about the Bible. They are not God-breathed. They are not inspired. They are not holy. I'm a fan of all of them, uh, as you can see from 
from the things that I've talked about here before. But they do not belong in the binding of our Bibles. Uh, this is That's the real separation of church and state. When we talk about the separation of church and state, it's not we should protect the state from the church, but we need to protect the church from the state. And implementing the state's documents into the binding of our Bibles, I think, is a bad idea. So Trump is right that many people haven't read the Constitution or the founding documents, but be that as it may, to use Holy Week as an avenue for getting people to read these documents because you've inserted them into the Bible binding, I think it's wrong and antithetical to the gospel. And I believe, actually, our founding fathers would have been rolling in their graves, all of them, including the devout ones. Uh, Yes, our rights are being threatened, but again, this has nothing to do with the Bible. Stop using it as a prop. Yes, the reason our country has drifted into insanity is certainly because of a drifting away from the gospel. But this Bible and this commercial won't help that fact. In fact, I think and I expect it will do the exact opposite. I highly doubt, I highly doubt that the Bible is Trump's favorite book, by the way. I think it's probably The Art of the Deal. That's the that's book he wrote. I think he probably thinks it's the, it's the greatest book. But he's selling this book as a political tool. He doesn't believe everything that he's saying here. He's selling it as a political tool. Trump is right that in the end we do not answer to bureaucrats bureaucrats, but to God in heaven. He should take his own advice, really, and repent of this commercial and of many other things in his life and come to Jesus. I don't think he's a Christian. I hope he is. I hope everyone will turn to Christ. Um, But if he's not, he needs to repent. He has said in the past that he doesn't think he needs to repent of any sins. That's a big red, big red flag, flag to me. Um, and lastly, yes, Trump is right that the left certainly wants to silence and marginalize certain Christian groups, especially pro-life and conservative Christians. Yes, we're drifting from our theological foundations as a country. Yes, we need to make it back. But no, a president shilling for religiosity by using a Bible will not do that especially this one. So again, yes, to all of that, except I don't think he's serious. It's a political stunt. And sure, we want people to pray and read their Bibles. Um, I say just don't get that one. Don't buy that Bible. Uh, Later in the commercial, he says, let's make America pray again uh, by spreading our Christian values. And this is 2 Timothy 3.5. 2 Timothy 3.5 says, holding to a form of godliness, they deny its power. And I think that's what's kind of going on here. We need a political uh, power. We need we need to have a political politicized Bible. Uh, I don't think that's the case. Uh, we don't spread our Christian values. We spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we are called to do, not just our Christian values. We want our Christian values to spread, but it is more important to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is really what the biggest Christian value there is. So what should Christian Jew do? What should we what should we do? Well, first, I don't think we should buy this Bible. Uh, I think we should buy a Bible, but not this one. Um, I don't think we should play into the grift. I think we should call balls balls and strike strikes and say this is a bad move. This is bad, Trump. You this is not good. Does this mean Trump loses your vote? I don't think it necessarily has to. I do think it th- these are the sorts of things that give me pause more than anything else. These are the sorts of things that start to drive me away. Um, from the political landscape. So if Trump wants to turn more people off like myself from voting for him, he can go ahead and keep doing this. Um, But I don't think it means you ought not vote for him. But I do think God will not be mocked, and we need to stand up. All right, on to our next topic. (laughs) Okay, so as you can tell, I have a little bit of a... I don't know, it's like sickness or something going on. So bear with me if I've got a got a cough and things like that. So uh, our second topic today is an apologetic from the cross. Uh, so it's Good Friday as I'm recording this, and, and this will probably come out uh, tomorrow on Saturday. Um, and so I would be remiss not to talk about things that are going on in the conservative politosphere. We'll get to that. Um, but I want to take time here uh, to talk about an article that I wrote a few years ago called An Apologetic from the Cross. And it's probably my least read article. That's fine. Um, 
I'm, I'll, I'll post it in the description if you want to read it. I'm not saying go and read it. And or what, I, what I'm saying is this, this is actually a seminal moment in my Christian life, uh, in ministry, um, because I realized I was wrong. And I realized I was wrong, not about what Jesus accomplished on the cross, but what, but, but about his disposition and what he accomplished. Let me explain. Uh, I grew up with the understanding that the cross was effective, but that it was such a damaging experience. It was so traumatic for Jesus that the Trinity, the Father, uh, when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father turns his back on the son and rejects him because of our sin. And, and that's the, that's kind of the punishment that we were supposed to take. Um, and, and there's a tremor in the Trinity and there's division in the Trinity, Trinity for the first time. Uh, I don't think this makes sense because all of the angst that Jesus had, um, and, and I had, a I had, I shared this and I had a guy who's actually a supporter of this program and and somebody that I've been in ministry for a long time with. Uh, I had a guy when I shared this at camp once come at, come up to me and just gently correct me and say, you might want to rethink what's going on here. And I think uh, it makes, it makes sense that my understanding of what was happening there is actually not right. And so I'm not trying to change your understanding, but I would, I do, <laughs> I do want to give you a, a perspective that maybe you've heard before, maybe you haven't, uh, and I and I want to run through it a bit here today because Good Friday is the Friday that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and uh, it's it's before Easter and then Easter Sunday when He declares victory over sin and death. But but we don't get Sunday without Friday, so Friday is very important. Even though I do obviously the Apostle Paul says without the resurrection in Second and um, First Corinthians fifteen without the resurrection or our hope is void, uh, but we don't get the resurrection without the sacrifice. So it's so important, um, and it's something that we need to talk about more. <laughs> Excuse me, but I don't think it makes sense that that the father turns his turns his back. Uh, it's even in the song, the father turns his face away, and and I don't think that's actually what's going on here. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe I'm wrong. Um. But Hebrews 9 outlines the fact that the offering for our sins was effective because Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies by his own blood and not the finite blood of some animals. That his sacrifice was acceptable and pleasing to God. So why would God the Father turn away from him? And along with this, if we analyze the other words of Jesus on the cross, none of them have to do with his own plight except for maybe him declaring that he's thirsty and needing water. So let's look at some quotes from Jesus on the cross real quick, uh, and then recording the Gospels, and then we'll compare them. All right. So I'm going to look at six quotes. So I'm going to look at six quotes. Um, first one is, A father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. And then when Jesus is discussing things with the thieves on the cross, uh, and one says, hey, this man has done nothing. Hey, uh, Jesus, remember me when you enter paradise. Uh, Jesus says in Luke 23, 43, today you will be with me in paradise. In John 19, 26, we read Jesus talking to the uh, disciple and apostle John, and his mother's there, and he says, um, mother, behold your son. Woman, behold your son. Uh, and he's making sure that his mother is going to be taken care of, that she won't be left empty and destitute without someone to take care of her. Um, and he places John in her stead to be able to take care of her. Um, then in Mark fifteen thirty four, Jesus says, it's, it's, it's interesting, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We'll get to that in a little bit. Then he says in John nineteen thirty, it is finished. And then in Luke 23, 40, 46, we hear, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So all of these things, all of these things, except for the fourth one I talk about, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, seem to be others focused. He asks his father to forgive those that are falsely accusing and killing him. He takes time to soothe the man's soul who's starting to recognize that Jesus is who he says he is, and he deserves death on the cross. 
He takes time to honor his mother by making sure she's taken care of after his death, resurrection, and ascension. Why the sudden shift from others to himself when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think it's not because Jesus is changing his disposition. I think it's because it plays into his disposition of being others focused. Jesus isn't saying that God the Father is turning his back on him, but he's quoting Psalm 22. And he ends his life by quoting Psalm 31. And I encourage you to go read those Psalms and look how they correspond with what is going on in Jesus' life here. So I don't think Jesus has been selfish or self-focused here. I think what he's doing is he's wanting the believers or the non-believers, the people watching him die, he's wanting to say something to guide them to the prophecies about who he is and what he must suffer. He is being others-focused in this moment. It is him exhibiting his care for the souls that are mocking him and watching him perish. It's an apologetic from the cross. It's Jesus saying, you think you're doing something, but let me help you understand what's actually going on so that you can be saved. Jesus is hoping, knowing that there are those in the audience watching and listening that will end up responding to this act of, to this act of, uh, of self-sacrifice with devotion to him just a little over 50 days later at Pentecost. Thousands of people come to Jesus. Could some of them have been reflecting back to when Jesus quoted Psalm 22 and Psalm 31? And why does Jesus know this? Jesus knows this because he is king. His dominion will reign forever, and he will put all of his many all of his enemies under his feet. He's king over the universe, his creation, and his disciples, and he wants people to recognize and know it. And that's what's going on on the cross, I think, on Good Friday. So I'm not saying you should stand up in your uh, in, in your Good Friday service and uh, declare, that's wrong if it's, it's something said or if you sing those lyrics, because perhaps I'm wrong. But I think it offers another perspective, a perspective that says Jesus is not angry with the Jews that are killing him, he is loving, lovingly begging them to respond with the realization that he is who he claims to be. So this Holy Week, I, I ask us to not forget that Jesus' victory on the cross was not overshadowed by a sinful weight that caused a rift in the Trinity, but was a divine plan that healed a rift between his creation and himself. And what he desperately wanted, what he desperately wanted was those standing there to know this. He wanted them to know that he is really king of the Jews, like it said on his cross. He wanted people to come to saving faith in him. And I think that's what he's doing on the cross there. So take it or leave it. I think that's what's going on. Um, post comment below. Have you heard this before? Uh, is this give you a new perspective? Uh, and read the article. We'll post that in the comment in the uh, in the link description as well. Uh, this leads me to my next topic, and unfortunately, during this time of Holy Week, we've also seen some reprehensible things going on on Twitter or X, and maybe if you're not on there, this whole topic is going to be new to you, um, so I apologize. Uh, but a true phrase, one that we ought to affirm, one that Christ is trying to declare before Pilate, Christ is trying to declare before everyone on the cross, Christ, com Christ declares in his ascension, all power and authority has given to me. Uh, and that Christ will declare once and for all when he returns, a true phrase has been hijacked by nefarious people on the internet. What's new, right? And that phrase is Christ is king. Now, there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to cover it as quickly as I can. But uh, if you have Twitter or follow conservative politics or anything, you might have noticed a short phrase gaining steam late, lately, and that's the phrase Christ is king. And you might say, well, that's great. Uh, and I agree. I agree that it's great that that is trending. What I don't agree with is how some people are using it. Uh, and this is important because some people are saying it doesn't matter how it's used. Uh, we should just we should just rejoice that it's used. Uh, and I sympathize with that. I really do. But what I, what I want us to think about is our witness is tainted. Uh, our witness is not um, supposed to be tainted by people on the outside. And so we need to call it as it is. So there are some people that have hijacked this phrase um, 
to mean something that it doesn't mean. And I think it's important to recognize this. So uh, one of them, Andrew Tate, uh, says, as a Muslim, it warms my heart to see the resurgence of spirited Christian declarations. Christ is king. He's a Muslim. He doesn't think Christ is king. Sneeko, another guy, and I don't really know who he is, is, is also a Muslim. He says, Christ is king. Did that on March 24th. Why, why, are, these, why are these Muslims saying this? Uh, it's not because they actually think Christ is king. Uh, it's it's for another insidious purpose. Uh, and I want to take a look at this because uh, if if you'll notice, if you've noticed, there was, uh, there was also a rift in conservative political sphere because Candace Owens, if you know who she is, conservative commentator, um, who was part of the Daily Wire, recently parted ways with the Daily Wire, presumably over use of this phrase. So the question is, is the Daily Wire being anti-Christian or is Candace Owens playing into some anti-Semitic rhetoric? Um, and the Daily Wire, run by a lot of Christians, now a lot of Christians in the Daily Wire, I think, don't have great theology. Um, I'd love to have a conversation with Andrew Clavin some, someday. Um, I, I think his theology is a little bit confused sometimes. Um, he's a novelist, so he, think, he, he thinks a little bit differently than I do. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, he had some things to say. Uh, Michael Knowles, Matt Walsh, they're Catholics, uh, so they'll probably have a little bit different perspective than I do on this. Uh, but I do want to play a snippet of of uh, what Andrew Clavin said about Candace Owens' departure, and then I want to take a look at where we're getting this. Okay, so again, we'll uh, we'll adjust here. So this is Andrew Clavin. If you don't know who he is, I think that's fine. You don't have to know who he is, but this is who he is. So uh, about a three-minute video. I don't know if we'll watch the whole thing, but this is something Andrew Clavin's going to talk about. He's talking specifically about the drama going on with Candace Owens. So uh, let's take a listen. Easy stuff about going DEFCOM on the Jews. Fine. She has a mentally ill friend. She stood by him, you know, fine. You know, it was a little uncomfortable, but still, you know, so what? You know, she attacked this guy, Rabbi Shmuley. I will tell you, with all honesty, I don't even know who Rabbi Shmuley is. I have no idea. I didn't look him up. I haven't seen anything from him. You know, she's complaining about him. Fine. You don't like a rabbi? You're allowed not to like. You're allowed not to like Ben. You're allowed not to like anybody you don't like. If you can sp spell it out for me, what the problem is. But when you start saying things like some of those books Hitler burned were so bad, you know, I, I was shocked. This is something Kansas actually said. I was surprised to learn that the books Hitler was burning or the Nazis were burning. They weren't. They weren't good books. They were bad books. They were socialist books. <laughs> So, so, you know, they burn, that's true. <laughs> burning the book is the, the act of a savage, first of all. And when you start with burning books, you start burning people. But they burned Joseph Conrad, one of my favorite writers, Kafka, Hemingway, Jack London, and yes, some socialists, some of whom were extremely talented and some of whom were extremely interesting, like Karl Marx is an extremely interesting writer with whom I deeply, deeply disagree, but I don't burn his books because I'm not a savage. When you start saying that, you're saying, that's a dog whistle. I'm sorry. I know it's a leftist phrase. I know they use it, you know, randomly with anything you say. I understand all of that. Still, still, the, the, the depredations of the Nazis against the Jews are one of the most well-documented, recorded atrocities in human history because they're Germans. They're Germans. They keep records. They keep very good records. We know these things happen. They weren't burning books. You know, they, they also hated Einstein because his science was Jewish science. They hated Mendelssohn, one of their great composers, because his music was Jewish music. That's the way they thought. There is lunacy. It's lunacy to think that way. So when you start to say, well, you know, some of those books they burned are, you know, are bad books, I'm sorry. That's a that's a, a dog whistle. When you retweet a post saying a Jew is drunk on Christian blood, which goes back, as I'm sure you know, to old blood libel that, that you know, Jews eat Christian children, you know, that's a, a dog whistle. When you start to refer in this kind of clever way to a certain group of people in Hollywood corrupting blacks and killing Michael Jackson, you're, you're not allowed to then put on an innocent look and say, well, I'm just saying there's certain people, just a few, you know, it's not, I'm just saying, you know, you're messing with us. You're messing with us and everyone knows it 
And no one is fooled except those people who want to pretend to be fooled because they hate the Jews. Okay. So he goes on to say that if you use um, the phrase Christ is King to shield yourself from these sorts of opinions, uh, that you you are participating in anti-Semitism. Uh, and and I would agree. I tend to agree. I think um, using a phrase like crisis creed, which is objectively true, it's an objectively true statement and one that I think we ought to say, um, does not shield you from opinions like that. And so what happens is pe- people say that, and that's why Tate and Sneeko are saying, yeah, crisis king, um, because now it's become a pejorative against the Jewish people. Um, and people say that. And they go, well, well, what are you, what are you fighting back for? I, I'm just saying, you should agree, you're a Christian. Christ is King, uh, and we, we're seeing it all over Twitter now. So uh, here's another overlay for us. It's uh, the, the, this person saying, "Hey, um, good for this guy named Nick Fuentes for uh, reestablishing the the phrase Christ is King." Well, I'll, again, recall what Andrew Clavin's saying here what Andrew Clavin just recently said. Uh, and then let's go and see what Nick Fuentes has to say um, in regards to this. So here we go. Are you ready? The reason why anyone would have a problem with somebody saying Christ is king is because Jews run America and they hate Jesus. The diehard Christians of the conservative movement say, we can say Christ is king anytime, any place, and I agree with that. And then on the other side, you have all these Jews, and they say, well, you're a Groyper. If you say Christ is king, there's a way you can say it where you mean you hate Jews. So there's this big, ugly fight. Oh, no, and I hate to see it. It's one of those moments when it's really a mask off. Yeah, I do agree it's a mask off. Um, I agree it's a mask off, not for what Joel Berry's saying, but I, I think it's a mask off. And and again, it's interesting because nobody, as far as I can tell, there's a few people, I'm not going to say nobody, a few people, but most people aren't saying that the phrase, that you can say the word, the phrase Christ is King in a way that's anti-Semitic. That's not the point. The point is you say the phrase Christ is King to cover up and excuse your anti-Semitism. And Nick Fuentes does it right there. He does it right there. He says, he says, Oh, uh, we should say Christ is King all the time. And the reason you don't like it is because Jews run America, Jews run Hollywood. Remember what Andrew Clavin said. Uh, and he's right. Those are anti-Semitic tropes. Jews run the world. They run everything. And we want Christ is Christ to be King. He's going to run everything. And you can't handle that because you want the Jews to run everything. Um, and to say, I'm not offended by saying Christ is King at all because he is and he will put all of his enemies under his footstool but i also am not going to play into this idea that everything that that's bad that's going on in the world is because of our relationship with israel or because of jewish people or that there's some sort of jewish cabal that runs all of hollywood or or uh, all of all of the world's uh, economic systems um and and frankly uh, frankly fuentes doesn't Fuentes doesn't understand what he's talking about because uh, the reason that Jews got rich in uh, medieval times, uh, whether or not we realize this, I don't know, but uh, share it now. The reason they got rich is because it was illegal in the Catholic Church, and Nick Fuentes says he's Catholic. It's it was illegal in the Catholic Church to uh, practice usury or to to practice the opportunity to gain interest on loaning. And so who did they leave that to? They left that to the Jewish people. So Jews would hand out loans and practice usury and make money off of uh, off of people who needed loans and needed to make a living. Uh, and so it's actually, if you want to say, well, how did these Jews get so rich and, and how did they get so powerful? You can say, well, the Catholic Church played a role in it. And, and here's the thing. Jews tend to be successful, uh, but I don't think it's because they run the this cabal of everything. It's interesting because I think one of the reasons this this is so off-putting to me is because it's just leftism on the right. It's just it's just victim uh blaming, it's just victimhood um embracing on the on the right. It's it's to say 
It's to say, well, the reason I'm not successful is because there's some cadre of people out there that want me to be unsuccessful, and they are silently uh, pulling the levers of power and uh, making me not be successful. And I don't like that. But I also don't like it because if we're using Christ as King as a pejorative against the Jews, we're not really preaching the gospel to them. We are, we are using, we're, we're using Jesus Christ as a curse word towards them. Uh, we want to lead them to Christ. So, so what's wrong with the phrase? Nothing is wrong with the phrase, but how we use words matters. So quickly, I want to look at Romans 11. I'll look at Romans 11 real quick, because there's a passage here that I think is super important, super important that I've highlighted. So this is Romans 11, 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. So this is Paul using agricultural imagery to say the Gentiles being grafted into the plan uh, to the, the vine of Christ. Verse 18, do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Um, one of the reasons that we can't use Christ's King as the phrase, the way that Nick Fuentes uses it, is because what it does, and again, Christ the King, Christ's King as the phrase is good. What it does is, and Andrew Claven again is right about this, what it does is it denigrates the very people our Savior came through. Jesus was and is a resurrected Jew. He came as a Jew, literally, in the tribe of Judah. And to say Christ is king in order to upset Jewish people, and there are people I've seen online say, oh, no, he, Jesus wasn't a Jew. He was Aryan. It's this remaking of Christianity that the, Nazi, that the Nazis did. They, they remade everything uh, of Christianity in, into a way that, that could supplement their evil ideology. Uh, saying, oh, no, Jesus wasn't really a Jew. Uh, people don't get that right. Jesus was a, and is a resurrected Jew. Uh, and so we ought to treat the people he came from with the same respect we treat everybody else. And it's interesting, uh, and I don't know if Candace is uh, anti-Semitic or not. I, I tend to think that this is just a bunch of hullabaloo and baloney that got blown up. Um and I don't think she necessarily is, but I do think she played into it to get out of her contract. Uh, and the Daily Row was like, fine, we're just, we're, we're going to be done. Um, and again, I'm not 100% pro everything that the Daily Wire does. There's a lot of things that I don't agree with, especially, especially, excuse me, especially theologically with, uh, with, with the Daily Wire people. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I think they get wrong, but that doesn't mean that they're wrong about this. Uh, so as I've said with phrases like Christian national Christian nationalism and others, I don't think we should let political whack jobs and hacks hijack objectively good things and phrases and force us to change our language. And it's interesting because this crisis king stuff is separating this form of form of ethnic Christian nationalism, which I think I, I would put Nick Fuentes in that category, uh, with with the type of uh, traditionalism that I would espouse. Um, so still, I think we should say Christ is king and say he's a Jew as well, and we love both Christ and Israel and pray for coming home of the people of Israel to their true Messiah. I'm not talking about the secular state of Israel. I'm talking about the people of Israel to their true Messiah. And we should pray for that. We should want that. And we should say Christ is king because Christ indeed really is king. All right. Let's get on to our main thing. All right. Our main thing today, I'm going to talk more about the Red Pill movement. This might be a little bit longer than I anticipated because there's a lot of stuff to go over. But a few months ago, we covered someone called uh, Pearl Davis. Uh, she's kind of a self-described anti-feminist. 
uh, that touts the failure of society towards men and supposedly speaks up for men's rights and the horrific state of affairs in our culture concerning male-female relationships. Um, and after years of seeking to be platformed and debate high-profile conservative pundits like Ben Shapiro, Michael Knowles, and others, she she did land that opportunity. So apparently this is the Daily Wire um, FT Monthly. I didn't even realize that until just now. Uh, but she she had a conversation with both Andrew Clavin and Michael Knowles. Uh, so I'm going to go through these interviews a little bit. Uh, and as I go through them, what I want to do is highlight some things. So first thing I want to say is I don't think Pearl is all wrong all the time. I don't have any inherent dislike for her, uh, but I do think she makes some fundamental flaws in her prescriptions. And I don't know that people have called out what those are well enough. So we're going to take a look at a few clips. We're going to explain a few of them. If you don't know who she is, it'll help us bring some context to this. Uh, and And as we do that, uh, we're we're going to be able to hopefully, hopefully talk about uh, the shortcomings here. So this is the first one. If if men are not supposed to get married, what is a man's life supposed to look like? What I, I don't say I don't say they should or they shouldn't. Okay. I, I think every guy has to decide for himself. Okay. You guys' options are going to be different than a different guy's options. I'm not here to tell men what to do. But I think using a blanket statement telling men to get married young without fully understanding women today and the laws is not the wisest. Right. Well, people who marry... Because, so, yeah. because, because in a business deal, you would never sign a contract in business that the other party is paid to leave. It would not be wise, right? If me and you were to do a business deal together, and if I break the deal... I get your children, <laughs> half of your stuff, and I, I can ruin your reputation. You would never do it. Okay. So so that's just a little snippet. Um, this is one of the central premises to uh, Pearl's vendetta against marriage. I don't know if she has a vendetta against marriage. Maybe, maybe I should put it a little softer. Um, uh, her exposure of the issues with marriage in our culture. Uh, and she says this constantly that she talks like it's a business. If if we entered into a business contract and you got paid to leave, um, that'd be a bad deal. And I've heard her say this multiple times. Unfortunately, Andrew does, plays right into it. He doesn't really he doesn't really reject the premise. I would reject the premise. I would say, okay, but it's not a business deal. It's not a business deal. You you are devaluing actually what is going on here it's not a business deal you may think that the culture looks at it as a business deal but that's part of what that's part of the thing that's 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 wrong and uh that's wrong and difficult so so yeah i i, I don't i don't agree with her there uh and we're gonna see this pop up again so let's take another look this is uh out of her interview with michael knowles now um and uh, this is about a two and a half hour interview. It's it's kind of interesting. You should listen to it. I'll post all of these in the link below. Um, but let's take a look. But is and, that and the is problem? That... And the, and the problem is that the state is the legal enforcement arm. Well, that's all. For, that's by definition. Co correct. So there is no way for a man to get married in 2024 without being entered into the state contract. But that's always and so and so I, I understand, but I understand men's hesitation when the quality of women has gone down. But what if, I, I don't tell men I don't tell men not to get married or like what to do. I think every man has to decide for themselves. But I, I don't think you're going to win a lot of support, or I, I I think you have to understand the problem in order to come up with a solution. Okay, so she she she's talking here. Uh, Pearl says you have to understand the problem in order to come up with the solution. So, so what is the problem? Again, she brings up once again this idea of uh, it's a bad business deal. It's a bad business deal. Uh, now, I would argue it's not a business deal at all. Um, so, let's talk about what it means to be in a covenantal relationship. Let's get back to that. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but she's gonna. She, so, so that's the key premise: is we okay? We need to understand the problem in order to come up with the solution. So, we need to know what Pearl thinks the problem is. We've already heard. Uh, that women being paid to leave a marriage is one of the problems to Pearl. But I don't think that's the only problem. Uh, but let's take another look at, um, let's take another look at 
at, at part of the interview uh, here again. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of moving around. Here you, go. you are telling men at the very least, you're observing that it is not advisable today in 2024 to get married. I would say that every man has to pick for himself. Okay. But I think objectively, if me and you sign a contract and one of us is paid to leave, you would never sign that business deal. You would I never sign, sign it. I did, right. <laughs> if, you're, if you're saying that's the state of marriage now, I did get married, therefore mm -hmm. I did sign it. Okay, so there it is again. Uh, it's it's that business deal. It's a key problem to Pearl. She said to Clavin, she says it online, she says it to Noel Skier. Basically, the government government's handling of marriage um, is the issue. Uh, but also, that's not the only issue to Pearl. If that was the only issue, it's interesting because she kind of obfuscates things and, and kind of talks around things, but but the low quality of women is the issue as well. She says multiple times in this interview, how many marriageable women are, are do you think there are out there? It's only like 5%. Um, and that's the other thing Pearl will do in, and, and maybe she has all of these sources to back it up, but I, but I just haven't seen them. She'll say they did a study. Well, who did? Well, she'll say, uh, just they did. And sometimes she has the study, uh, or she'll say, I talked to a specific individual that went through this specific issue. And while that specific issue sounds horrific and is awful, it's not, it's not falsifiable. And also, um, anecdotal evidence while important is not authoritative. So, um, we don't have a clue of exactly what's going on here, but, but that is part of whatever her assumptions are. And her knowledge claim is that she knows what the problem is and how to fix it. So if we recognize that initially she says the problem is it's a bad business deal. Women get paid to leave the marriage institution. And then she also says it's a bad deal um, because, uh, because there's low quality women. Uh, is that it though? And it's not it. She has another uh, proposal. She has another proposal here uh, that she is going to share um, in her interview with Michael Knowles about what the problem is. So let's take a look at that. This is uh, cut four that we're going to look at here. Studies were done before social media. Anyone that dated before and after social media knows it completely changed the game. It, How do you mean? Well, women now have access to men anywhere. And, and cheating mm. and goes up. Like, mm. dating, you know, the number one way people are meeting under 30 is dating apps. Yep. You know, I mean, this is a completely different dating marketplace than when you were dating. Though I guess and, that's, and that's my point. When I was dating there is no There's no Catholic woman in divorce court. Okay, uh, so so now she's going to go back to uh, the, the women are the issue. We'll get to that in a little bit, but but here she says that part of the problem is the advent of social media, and I don't necessarily disagree. But so she says social media changed the dating game. Okay, so women under the age of thirty five are completely different, and if they want to leave, there's no praying them to stay with you. All right, so so far the issues that we have that Pearl brings up in this specific interview and in her interview with Clavin are it's a bad business relationship because if women leave, they get paid. There's low value, low quality women, not marriageable women on the market right now. And then she also says that social media has changed the dating game, uh, which is is true, and that women under the age of 35 are completely different. They have access to all sorts of men, and cheating goes way up because of social media. Uh, I don't think I'm misrepresenting what she's saying here. Uh, and and I think those are those are the big issues. So to her, these are some of the big issues. Michael is going to drill down on something here that I think is very, very important. And so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take a a quick look at Michael's response here and then Pearl's response to this as well, because it's very important if she thinks we can't solve the problem unless we know what the problem is and then we got to solve it. Uh, okay. Well, you seem to know what the problem is. You've, you've at least mentioned three or four issues. Uh, so what do we do? And Michael does an interesting thing here. So listen, Include women over a certain age, right? You're that's, saying the young people, it's, a it's different totally different time, Michael. So what is, and that's, that's the same thing. Like the time my parents got married in is completely different. So what changed other than now they have apps, so they meet on apps rather than at bars. And that's the big change. That's why we can't believe the statistics anymore. Well, the average marriage is seven years now, Michael. Right. But we've had divorce, uh, 
expanded divorce for a long time. We've had uh, no fault divorce in America since 1969. So, you know, I acknowledge these are by historical standards, relatively novel, but we're still talking like 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. More than 50 years. I, I don't, you know, I just think a lot of times I hear you guys' advice to go to church and find, find a good woman. And I, I don't necessarily think it's bad advice in general. But again, I, I think that times have changed. And I think a, a lot of times you guys are a bit out of touch with what the average man is going through in this country. Well, what do you... Okay. Um, so again, we can't play all two hours. You can go watch it. Um, so, so he's going to ask, what do you mean by the average man? But it's interesting. There's a big pause when he asks, so what changed? So what changed? She claims to know that we need to know what the issue is. And yet, as he drills down on the question and asks, so what changed between the generations? It's kind of flummoxes Pearl. She, she doesn't have a response. She doesn't exactly know. She knows something changed, but she doesn't know exactly what changed. So she goes back to her notes in her head and, and says, well, I, I think that the advice is just old. It's just old advice. This is different. Um, but that didn't answer Michael's question. She says, okay, sure, we're looking at a lot of symptoms right now. But that doesn't answer what is wrong, what exactly changes. And, and I wish Michael would have camped out there a little bit more. He he goes on to ask, well, what's what's the average guy? What do you mean by that? I think he should have drilled down a little bit more on what changed because I think that's that is really what the problem is. Whatever changed is what the problem is, not some of these symptoms. So we don't know exactly what's wrong yet. We pointed out multiple symptoms. So without figuring out what changes, now we're going to get Pearl's advice on what needs to change. So she doesn't know what did change, but now she knows what needs to change. And uh, this is going to be cut six. Yeah. Um, this is going to be cut six. We are going to look at. It's hard when you're kind of your own producer, right? <laughs> Going out here? All right. So what so what changed? Him an abuse, you know, and even, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, calls him an abuser, says all these awful things. You know, he hasn't seen his kids in two years. It's awful. Yeah. And and it's it, it's the saddest thing when you see a man that's going through a divorce. So what's the alternative? Because I totally ag agree okay. with you about okay. the risk and the pitfalls of modern marriage. Well, I, I think that the laws need to change first because regardless of what I say... Before people get married? Well, it's not about what I say. It's about what people will do. You guys have... Okay, so so Michael does a good job here drilling down on... So, so there's a lot of grievance going on here. So what needs to what needs to change? And she says, well, the laws need to change first. But I don't know that she's ever stopped to ask the question of why did the laws change in the first place? That question is not asked. And, and later, as they discuss, they will get to this interesting point where I think Michael points out exactly what the flaw is in Pearl's view on the topic. Uh, and so I'm going to take a look at that. I'm going to take a look at that just shortly here. So I think this is where we start to see some positive movement and starting to understand what's going told on what to do by women so i think every man has to decide do you, do you not disagree do you disagree that every man should decide for himself what makes sense in his life i do i think men ought to do what's right okay and you know what's right i hope i do i hope i've cultivated my faculties of reason and moral conscience to such a degree that uh, they can uh, correspond with god's grace and basically lead me right yeah oh. i mean it almost sounds like you're playing god Okay, okay. Pearl completely misses the point here. She completely misses the point. She gets a little bit defensive, which I understand. These uh, Michael comes across as very uh, smooth and intellectual, and 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 uh, and I, th I think she might feel like he's questioning her intellect a little bit. Um, but she says, "Well, don't don't you agree?" She assumes he's going to say, "Yeah, I, I agree. Every man should decide." But it's interesting because he says, "No, every man should do what's right." And she goes straight to, well, well, you're the arbiter of what's right. Uh, and that's not what Michael's saying. Now, it's interesting because Michael does say, well, I think I know what's right because uh, I think I've had rational faculties, blah, 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 blah. He says all that. 
but the way I would have hoped to respond in that situation is, well, do you think you know what's right? I go, not all the time. I don't know what's right all the time, but I do know who knows what's right all the time. And that's where we need to point people to. And he's the one that established this covenantal relationship of marriage. And so I think men should aspire to the thing that God has created them to be. And that's not to say that marriage is a mandate. We'll get to that in a little bit. But I do think, I do think that is to say that I do think that is to say that a marriage is is a good thing that God instituted pre-fall. And uh and I think Michael kind of struggles a little bit uh in his response because he just wants to explain why he thinks he knows what's right, but I think you could even get to he he knows what's right because God has shown us what is right in his word. God has shown us what is right. Um so she wants to fix the institution, but she thinks that changing laws is the only way to get that done. And I'm going to grant her all of the research that she's done on the laws. I'm going to grant all of that and say, yes, that's all bad. I'm going to, I'm going to, even if I maybe disagree a little bit, I am going to grant all of that, but then say, I'm not sure fixing the law actually fixes the institution, even in that situation. So there's a few things, a few highlights of what Pearl thinks would help and uh i'm going to take a look at those i'm going to take a look at those uh pretty quickly but here is another small snippet so let's keep watching in in that case don't we need to deal with what that institution ought to look like so rather than say sit on your hands until we change no i say fix the institution that should be the number one thing because men are not going to return to ma- people are not going to return to marriage until you make the institution more fair. Well, what they'll doesn't do is matter, they'll return. Yeah. Doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what I say. You guys have been preaching marriage for a decade, yeah. and the rates of marriage have still been going down. Why? Because the cost is too high and the quality of women is too low. How do you fix it? Right. Well, they just- increase the quality of the women. You say stop being fat. <laughs> that's the number one. <laughs> don't don't go on OnlyFans. It might be on the list. Don't, I don't know if it's number one. I mean, I for know. men, that's like the number one thing. I, I wouldn't say it's. In, okay. I'm, well, I'm blessed with a okay. thin wife. Not now because she has a child. Now, but. Okay, but but you, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. And until you you lower the risk for men, the the yeah. utopia you're asking for isn't it's, going it's to not return. A utopia. I'm describing no, no, the human no, but condition the, for all like, of history. Okay, but. okay, so so here we get some of Pearl's prescriptions. Um, she says, I want to fix the institution. How do I do that? Raise the value of woman, women. And, and how does she propose to do that? Well, make sure women aren't fat, first of all. Um, okay, that seems uh, fairly shallow. Uh, she gets into some other things. Make sure women don't do OnlyFans. And uh, I think that she starts to realize she's not talking about changing the laws anymore. So first she says, we need to fix the institution. She says, oh, we need to change the laws first. And then she says, well, actually, we need to change the people. Oh, you're almost onto it, Pearl. You're almost onto it. Um, but here's a few highlights of also what some things that Pearl thinks uh, would be good to change. So here's here's another snippet from that. Here's another snippet from from that interview. Porn stars as preachers. <laughs> you oh, haven't yeah. seen that? Oh, it's. No. Let's rewind this. Porn stars as preachers. <laughs> you haven't seen that? Oh, it's. No. Oh yeah. At least they're ex-porn oh, yeah. stars, better than current porn oh, stars. Thank God. You know? yeah, but people, no, <laughs> but, I mean, but, but even that. But that's my. That's my point. I mean, you is, know, look, is, is, Saint Paul persecuted Christians, you know, <laughs> and then he was knocked off a off a horse on the road to Damascus, and you know, became the apostle to the Gentiles. So pe- people can change their lives, and I think that's something you're kind of downplaying here. No, I, I'm not downplaying that people can change their lives. What I'm downplaying is that it, not downplaying. What I'm saying is that it's not really wise for men to date former sex workers, regardless of what they say. Why not? Why not? I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying it's ideal, but, but um, why because not? I why think the best wise? predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So right there, she downplays it, right? <laughs> um. No, this is not me saying, yeah, go date OnlyFans models or go date porn stars or whatever. And 
Um, and she's saying, oh, there's a porn star, a former porn star. That's a pastor's wife. And I, I think I know who she's talking about, but I can't, can't exactly remember the name. I didn't do, I didn't do the research into that, into that part. Um, and I, I didn't want to Google it. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting because Michael says, oh, I think you're downplaying this. She goes, oh, no, I'm not downplaying it. People can change. Um, but it's not wise to date a former uh, adult film star. And uh, Michael goes, why? And she goes, well, because past behavior is indicative of future behavior. Uh, so, so again, she's saying the risk is that the woman isn't actually changed and she's just doing it as a grift. And uh, it's wiser for men not to do that. Well, that removes the individual autonomy from the situation. Maybe that's the case for some. I don't know. Um, but I don't think saying all these women that have done this are completely irreparable. At one time, when I was in ministry, we were, we were uh, doing a we were doing a a mission trip, and there was a there was a guy that wanted to share about um he wanted to share about purity, and so we got up to do a purity talk. And I've seen this happen a lot of times. Sometimes it's food, sometimes whatever. He 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 brings out a candy bar. He starts licking the candy bar all over, and uh, it's getting gross and disgusting. And he goes, "Well, who wants the candy bar now?" And everybody, you know, a few knuckleheads say they want the candy bar because they want to be gross. Um, but most of everyone knows it's not desirable. We don't want a candy bar. And he says, and, and then he said, this is what happens when you have sex before marriage. And I thought, when I've listened to that, I thought, well, this is a great scare tactic for all the kids who haven't done anything. But for the kids who have, for the young women and young men who have, the idea is now now you are worthless, you're irredeemable, and uh, nobody should actually want you, and you should just live alone the rest of your life. It's almost a little bit of what, what Pearl's saying here. Hey, you don't deserve redemption or love because you made all of these bad mistakes when you were younger and stupid and thought that the money was worth trading your body for. And what she also doesn't take into consideration is a lot of these young women are trafficked. It's not really their choice. They're trafficked into it. And so to say, well, they, you know, past behaviors, future, well, maybe it wasn't really, maybe they were coerced and now they've broken free and they can find freedom there. Uh, so I think she's really underselling that. Uh, she gets into another prescription as well. She gets into another uh, prescription as well uh, shortly thereafter. And I uh, want to take a look here at uh, what she has to say, because this is another thing that she says would help. And we're going to take a look at a real life scenario that she tweeted out after this to talk about why that's not necessarily the, the the there should be mandatory DNA testing at birth. No. I don't know why you okay because I, it's pr calling my wife a whore to do that. I mean, it's ridiculous. Why? why? Okay, so because women... the the assumption of the man of the first of all mandatory good grief, but the the uh, premise of it is that my wife is sleeping around. Okay, so so I'm the quite confident the my woman, wife is not sleeping. The woman, around. the woman. Okay, yeah. I, this is just a low a low view of I'm sorry, it's just a low view of women, a low view of marriage. Have there been instances where women have had other people's child and uh, forced a guy to raise raise the child? Sure. Is that the norm? I don't think it's the norm. And also, uh, if you're married saying I want a DNA test is maybe going to ruin your marriage. So here we have Pearl suggesting that OnlyFans models or former porn stars can't change. Past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. That men shouldn't have to raise a child that isn't theirs biologically. So we should do mandatory DNA testing so we can get out of that relationship. Even if he loves the woman and would take care of the child, even if it wasn't his, he needs to get out of that relationship. Um, so I want to take a look at a few uh, Twitter threads to help us kind of sort through this issue because I think it's important. And then uh, we'll talk about a fundamental flaw, I think, in this red pill movement um, and possibly even in Andrew Clavin and Noel's responses. Uh, so the first thing I want to look at is, uh, is this overlay here. So this is a, this is a young woman that uh, had an OnlyFans account. I don't know what her name is. I think it says uh, Fitness Nala on some of the things that I was looking at. And look at this. She, she, you can look at the New York Post article, but you can see people were raking her over the coals because she hadn't deleted her OnlyFans account immediately. 
Uh, and she explains in this New York Post article that uh, she needed to get the tax documents. She had to have a video. So she took all the videos off and uploaded a different video so she could get the tax documents. And once she got the tax documents, she deleted her OnlyFans account. And people were not celebrating this. Why can't we celebrate a young woman that has decided to leave the industry? I think it's super I think it's super weird that we want that we don't want to do that. Um and and it's interesting because it's not like it's not like Pearl has had a consistent issue with porn. In fact, I bring up um Pearl on an OnlyFans model. She says, "Hey, step 1, start an OnlyFans, make a ton of money, turn 28 and you're not hot, find God at 29, denounce porn and degeneracy and lecture everyone else, become a Christian influencer, get more money and fame." Uh, and then, and then people saying, "Oh, this young lady, uh, this Nala lady, she started a, a clothing line on Instagram right after the, so it's a grift." No, she's trying to replace the income with a type of income that she knows how to do because she knows how to use social media. She's trying to do that in a way that glorifies and honors God. Give, you know, love is supposed to think the best. And my hope is that Nala is a true convert. She loves Jesus, and she's actually trying to learn and grow. Um, and I think, and I think the evidence points to the fact that she is. And Pearl would say, don't trust her. Don't trust her. She's not worth trusting. But Pearl hasn't been consistent on porn either. Because just recently, Pearl said this about pornography. Genuinely, I can't think of one guy who said his entire life was destroyed by porn. I've heard many, I've heard men say it may be improved when they cut it out, but never the devastating stories I hear women prattle on about. Well, here, uh, Pearl, who has also said, to be fair, other places that she thinks porn should be illegal, which is, uh, you know what, Pearl and Pearl, you and I, we can lock lock arms on that as well. I do too. But this is her downplaying the man's responsibility in the porn industry. Michael brings this up as well. He says, well, men are the reason for porn industry. Uh, and she's like, oh, no, it's just the women. It's like, well, there wouldn't be a... There wouldn't be a need or or a niche uh, to offer pornography and tons of tons of money in it if it weren't for men consuming it. Women are very 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 low percentage of porn consumers. It's growing, but it's mostly men. Um, and so to say that uh, oh it's it's just the performer's fault. I, you, no, men bear responsibility too. So I, I think Pearl's problem doesn't seem to be with marriage in general. Pearl's problem is with women. And people, say, she says all the time, well, people think I hate women. I don't hate women. Um, and I'm not saying she hates women. I think she has a low view of women. She takes the worst of women and applies it to all women. And she takes the worst of men and says that that's women's fault. She says women have driven men to this. It's it's commiseration. I think that's all it is. And I'm not even saying this because I dislike Pearl. I, I think she has some important things to say, and I agree with some of the things that she has to say. But I think she stops short of usefulness because she doesn't actually think through all of the implications. Mandatory DNA testing being one of them. I want to take a look in a little bit at a story that she posts um, that's important to that's important to consider when it comes to mandatory DNA, uh, DNA testing. So I think it's it's really what this is, is, is grievance uh, monetized. Uh, so in light of all of this, there's this one fundamental thing that Pearl and the Red Pill community gets wrong. Um, say marriage is not salvageable as an institution. Marriage is only salvageable if they, I'm sorry, if they say marriage is only salvageable as an institution by changing the laws, um, then it's not salvageable because it's not the laws that make marriage marriage. Um, it's only salvageable as an institution promoted by Christ likeness and discipleship. And, and that might be a silly trope to some people, but the answer to the issue of divorce has always been a heart issue, not a civic issue. I want to take a look at what Jesus says about, about it as an institution in the, uh, in the old Testament in Matthew 19, eight through nine, Jesus in the new Testament is speaking of the old Testament here. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. <clears throat> what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that no matter what the culture says about divorce or the laws concerning divorce, there is a higher law according to Christ. 
And this is this is why Pearl is wrong. She claims to be Catholic, a woman of the faith. I'm going to take her at her word. But she misses out that this, the, the saving of marriage does not start in the courtroom, but it starts in the bedroom. And I don't mean this in a sexual sense, but in an intimate sense. Who is with you when you are alone? Is it just you and your thoughts and your wife, or is God in the room with you? She flatly denies the power of the gospel in that sense. Uh, she denies that it's possible to have this expectation of a lifelong commitment anymore because of the way the culture has shifted. And I agree that it's hard and more difficult, but that doesn't mean it's not worth not worth moving towards. Um, she believes that women are the problem in general, not sin. She insists that changing the law will change the behaviors, but I don't think it will. And even if I grant that the laws disadvantage men in divorce court, her prescription is enabling, not confronting, saying we need to get prenups, mandatory DNA testing, saying those things actually undermine the institution of marriage. It does not help it. So uh, I, I have something far worse. I have something personally far worse than losing my money and my, my property if my wife leaves me. That's why it's not a business decision. If my wife leaves me or if I leave my wife, we lose something much, much more valuable than our earthly possessions. What Pearl doesn't realize is that, and, and as Michael indicates, she is merely asking for more fair divorce laws in a lot of sense, that, but she's not asking for better marriages. And when she is asking for better marriages, she lays all the onus on the woman. If she really wanted better marriages, she wouldn't. Uh, she she definitely wouldn't uh, underplay the 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 porn industry, uh, saying, "Oh, men's lives haven't been ruined." So, women can divorce men because they're looking. They have a problem with porn. That's fine. That is unfaithfulness. That doesn't mean they should or that they ought to or that's the only prescription. But it does mean that it can happen. So don't underplay what what the role porn has in this. Don't underplay the role that porn has in just the relationship in general. Even if divorce is not on the table, the marriage is, is rocky because of porn in general. And for every OnlyFans girl debasing herself for cash, there's multiple married men spending money to view her body instead of loving their wives. Excusing male behavior and creating the market for porn by denigrating the women involved in porn is a bad take. It's a bad take. That doesn't mean the women are doing a good thing. It doesn't mean that they're morally in the right. Women playing on the predations of men to make money uh, is not right. Uh, but it doesn't absolve men of responsibility either. So Pearl makes a, a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, Pearl makes the same mistake that a lot of people did with COVID. Single factor analysis. You either get sick or don't get sick. Those are the two most important things. We can shut everything else down because nothing else matters. Um, but there's the here's the thing. The real problem is is not that marriage, there's this single factor analysis of we might get divorced. It, there are multiple factors to analyze here. There are multiple factors to analyze here. And, and the real problem is that the church has stopped doubling down on marriage. I, I had a pastor friend of mine years ago separate from his wife uh, a few years ago. Uh, he remained in the pastorate after he did so. His denominational president told him, at least this is the words to me, it's okay, divorce doesn't have the same social or church-wide stigma now as it did 20 years ago. That, that's a problem. That's a problem. We've played into this idea that marriage is a social club, that it's an option, that uh, when we enter into it, it's not necessarily a life, a lifelong covenantal relationship. It's a temporary contract, and we want to make sure that we get out of it the best thing that we get out of it, that it's optional for a thriving society, and that sex is the goal of marriage and not a tool for intimacy within marriage, and that sex is apart from marriage and different than marriage, so so we can enjoy the intimacy of sex apart from our mar marriage partner, that the goal is winning in marriage when the goal in both accounts should be self-sacrifice, not winning. And again, I'm granting all of the issues that Pearl has with the divorce court system. I get it. But I do not believe marriage is mandated in Scripture, but I do believe it's lauded, it's an institution established by God, and it should be practiced generally, regardless of its pitfalls. So one of the last things I want to get to, 
Um, one of the last things I want to get to here is is this DNA testing thing. I have an overlay for that. That's the last one. So uh, I don't know if you can read that. Maybe you'll have to pause and zoom in. And I'm going to summarize the story. I'm not going to read the whole story. But Pearl shared the story, and she said, I don't understand. If she has a problem, what's the issue? Um, trust but verify. So basically this is a story of a guy that's like, hey, I think I might have ruined my marriage because him and his wife had a baby, and he wasn't taking care of the baby, and she was getting frustrated with him, and he was trying to help around the house. And uh, she's, he, he's, he still didn't really take care of the baby, but he would take care of some other things. Um, you can read through the, the whole story. And finally, he says, well, actually, what I want is a DNA test to make sure the baby's mine. Um, and so she she provides him a DNA test. She doesn't act upset. She provides him a DNA test. And then she starts treating him really horribly. And he says, what's going on? I'm fine now. I, I know the baby's mine. I'm helping out. Uh, and, and she goes, I've lost all my respect for you because you made me get a DNA test. Well, so here's the thing. Is there some onus on her? Yeah, maybe she should have had that conversation before she agreed to get the DNA test. Um, but at the same time, he says at the end of this, I tried to tell her I didn't think she was being unfaithful, but I just had to be sure. He also admits that he thought about this because of some podcasts and stuff that he had listened to. Um, and I responded to this on Twitter um, because it's like, well, what's her problem? She sh why is she upset? She's upset because he pretends like he trusts her. He says, oh, I'll only take care of this child if I can know for sure that it's mine which means that there is a chance that she had a baby with another man. He tacitly and casually accuses her of possibly cheating and having a baby, not just cheating, but having a baby with another man, lying about it and expecting him to raise it. And, and Pearl sees no problem with this. That is part of the issue. That is trying to win at marriage rather than living with trust and love for your spouse. There's something deeper going on, I think, in that marriage than, than, the, guy, than the guy lets on. So that, that is a problem. No, DNA testing is not going to solve trust issues. It's going to make them worse. Because marriage is a risk, because it's a covenant relationship. And when God enters into covenant relationships with his people, God takes a risk. Israel rebels, the church constantly, I'm sure, disappointing God as his bride. But he stays faithful. He stays faithful. And this is why um, marriage needs to be doubled down on as an institution in the church. We must fix the institution in our churches before any law changes will do any good. I'm not saying don't go change the laws. Yes, sure, go change the laws. But that's not going to save marriage in the country, even if the laws are changed. So one of the lasting hopes of Christianity is our transformation from sinner into saint. We have a slew of young women and young men that have been lied to, they've been preyed upon, they've been told selling their bodies online for money is worthwhile endeavor that they won't regret. They're being groomed and trafficked, and many don't even know it. Pearl would suggest that none of them are marriage material, that there is possibly uh, no chance at reconciliation if that happens. And if they continue in their ways unrepentant, she's right, but to say that a woman like the gang lady we talked about before or Kat Von D or this other lady named Black China shouldn't be celebrated for their acceptance of the gospel is ridiculous on its face. To say all of them aren't marriage worthy because of their past is equally abhorrent. How many men have slept around and then got married? Maybe not on camera. So the picture of marriage is the picture of Christ with the church. There's too much at stake. There are problems. But looking at the problems, shrugging in response, it's, it's insidious. And saying that old, the only way we'll fix it is if we fix the court system first, I don't think that's, I don't think that's accurate. Let me know what you think. I, I think what we need to do is reform in the church and in our communities, and that will trickle to the church, or that will trickle, I'm sorry, to, to the laws. And the reason I say that is because I think that's what happened in the first place. So she wonders why the laws are the way they are. Well, the sexual revolution, divorcing sex from marriage, uh, all of a sudden, 19, so 1960s, is it, any, is it any surprise that in 1969, no-fault divorce becomes a thing in our country after the sexual revolution of the 1960s? 
the call is back to traditional way of understanding what marriage is supposed to be for. I, I tell young couples all the time, when you enter into marriage, you know that it's for life, but you don't realize it until much more into the marriage. But you have to be ready for the realizing and say, I am going to love this person 15 years in. Even though sometimes our life is tough, sometimes it's not as fun as it used to be, sometimes we got some real issues. we got to work out together because it's an institution worth salvaging. It's an institution that's covenantal. And that means I need to hold up my end of the bargain. DNA tests, prenups, and the like will not salvage this institution. They may salvage some anecdotal monetary or parental issues. I'll grant that. But even if they do salvage those, I think what they actually do is help to destroy the very institution that Pearl claims to want to salvage. Starting with the laws might work. I don't think it will because I don't think that's where the problem starts. All of her prescriptions, all her prescriptions do little to help save the institution she claims she wants to save, in my opinion. And at best, they simply neutralize the risk. They don't make it positive. Now, there are real and abiding issues in our courts, dating scenes, social media. Absolutely. I grant all of that. It's awful. But to allow men and women to run from marriage allows the degradation to continue apace. So what's my prescription? People say, well, you, you've kind of harped on her. What's my prescription? And as trite and as uh, tropey as it sounds, get people saved, disciple them into the faith, marry them young, and with expectations of a difficult but rewarding lifetime commitment, double down, don't bow out. And that'll do it for us today on FT Monthly. We hope you have a great Easter weekend. And as always, stay reasonable.